It was 5 a.m. on Wednesday morning when the calm of this South London street was shattered by six officers of Scotland Yard's serious crime squad. From a secure background, shared with his sextuplet brothers, Ronnie Scrote, while still in his teens, earned himself the unenviable title, Black Sheep of the Family. Even at school, Ronnie Scrote had a compulsive habit of telling tales, occasionally with serious consequences. His compulsion to inform in every job that he took kept Ronnie's periods of employment short and bitter. Unable to hold down a job, Ronnie soon found himself rubbing shoulders with the criminal fraternity, leading to inevitable consequences. Having spent 12 of the last 15 years in and out of one penal institution after another, Ronnie became a trusted member of London's underworld. But his habit of informing on all and sundry has remained with him. This was the fifth time in six weeks that a dorm raid by police has met with success. And Scotland Yard has admitted it was again acting on information from a single reliable source. A spokesman, however, declined to name the source on the grounds that this might prejudice their operation. And now, Ronnie, enjoying his seventh month of freedom, has been set apart from the rest of his criminal peers. For Ronald Scrote is what is known as a grass. On the day we caught up with him, Ronnie Scrote was alone. Alone because Ronnie Scrote has informed on his last colleague. Ronnie's compulsion to inform has, over the years, led to literally hundreds of arrests and the recovery of thousands of pounds worth of stolen goods. But this dubious habit has also subjected him to intimidation and repeated death threats. For the Metropolitan Police, however, informers are a precious and valued commodity. So Ronnie has been advised to apply for relocation, the assurance of a new identity and a new life in a foreign country. While he waits to hear if his application has been successful, Ronnie seeks solace in his home from home, the local pub. I've, uh, I've had the reply. They've, uh, <coughs> they say I'm going on the 18th. They haven't, uh, haven't told me where I'm going now, that's the problem. Still, I'm on my way, you know. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Don't say I told you, but this barman rigs this, you know. So why does a man like Ronald Scrote have this compulsive urge to inform on his colleagues? It was a uh, bloke in Wandsworth said it was a medical condition, me grassing all the time. I didn't believe him, he sold snout. Not for long, though. <laughs> there was another bloke in Pentonville that said it was to do him in family. Fat bloke he was, what was his name? George, Georgie Porgy, we called him. Yeah. He got a job in the kitchens because uh, he used to steal food. He did. That's how I told you. Though. I'm not quite sure where I'm going. Could be Rio, could be Spain. But of course, that's getting a bit overcrowded. I quite like to go to Mexico because I like Mexican food. You know, kebabs and all that stuff. Before he can be relocated, Ronald Scrote must disguise himself. For his own safety, this can only be achieved by extensive plastic surgery. Hi, Mr. Coles. I need, I need a bit of a face job. I need uh, alteration. What, what do you think you could do? Well, I, I get the impression that you feel that we can do something overall for you. Is that right? Yeah. Um, we really, unfortunately, can't do that sort of thing. Normally, when people come to the Harley Medical Group, uh, we attend to a particular problem they may have. They may have uh, eye bags, they may have crooked noses or sticking right. out ears or small chins, big chins, big breasts, small breasts. Uh, but to actually just do an overall change is pretty difficult. Is there, is there something you could do? Your features are pretty regular. Surgically, yeah. um, there is a way in which we can uh, perhaps enhance the hairline by bringing it down rather more by implanting plugs of hair along yeah. the, front of the front of it. But that, that wouldn't be a startling difference. It can be right. done. I suppose the major change would be in your nose. You, oh. you do have quite a lot of cartilage at the end of your nose. You've yeah. got a little bit of a lump in the middle of the nose. Uh, the bone could be cut. The cartilage could be reshaped. Oh, I'd look different then, would I? You'd look the same, but you'd look different. No scars? No scars, no. Right. No. Do you want scars? No. No, 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 not at all. People would still recognise me, though. They'd recognise you. But the overall effect, perhaps, if anything, would be just a, a pleasing change. It wouldn't be a totally different you. So if we were to have a go at the old thing, you know, hair, nose, eyes, cheeks, all that, uh, 
How much do you reckon it would um, cost then? Well, I would, I would say, and, and we're not including hospital costs now, I'd say around about 7,000. After this consultation, Ronnie told us of an acquaintance in Lewisham who could do the same job for a fraction of the price. This man, who declined to be filmed, first practiced plastic surgery in its early days on Spitfire pilots in the Second World War. This is Ronald Scrope's last night in Bermondsey, the last time he will be sharing a pint with his friends. Having spent 12 years in and around this neighborhood, it is time for a change. Tonight, Ronald Scrote is being relocated. But in keeping with police policy, the destination will remain secret until the moment of departure. The thing was, the bandages and all that, it's been scaring the kids on the estate. The mums have been complaining. I think I'm going to take them off. I'm going to take them off. <clears throat> They're supposed to be on for about three weeks, he said. But I'm not getting onto a bloody plane looking like the Invisible Man, am I? Eh? Not at all. He said it might be a bit sore, but <clears throat> he said... Because he, I reckon if you get, let the air to it, that's... Ow! 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 That's better, isn't it? Don't need to store anything. You see what he's done? I don't know if you can see what he's done. He's, uh, I've got a new hairline, right? Yeah. Got a new hairline. Cost me 80 quid, that. He's punched each one, each little tuft of hair, punched it in. And I've got eyes, new eyes. See him? Yeah. They cost me 80 quid as well. 40 quid a piece. And what he's done is, I don't know if you can see, he's pulled, me, he's cut and then just pulled it back. And a bit of a nose job, he said he's done. And he's, see your teeth, look? Got new teeth. No one's going to recognise me. I'll just blend. Very much better. Quite looking forward. Wish I knew I was going. Eh? Let's have a look. Hang on. Let's have a look. Hold up. Ah, uh, shit! <laughs> Eleven fifteen, and the first leg of Ronnie's journey to an unknown destination is about to begin. Oh, Mate, what's happening to you? Don't even ask. Don't even ask. I've had a nightmare, I tell you. Where are we going? What? Heathrow, Gatwick, Stamford, what? Which airport? Well, this bit of paper says I've got to drop you at King's Cross, mate. King's Cross? Yeah. Come on, Whiskers. King's Cross? King's Cross, mate. All oh, right. paper says. Yeah, I tell you what, if the governor who works in this bar, right, he's regularly serving drink up until about 12 o'clock. Joking, ain't you? No, honestly. I couldn't believe it. Wicked, eh? Don't say I told you. 